So I'm looking at um, bread from start surface modifications of anaerobically digested fiber, and we're specifically specifically looking at trying to get some of those nutrients out. We're working with anaerobic digestion and looking at this because while it can be a good system for managing some of the carbon waste, especially uh, flush dairy manure, it's not a nutrient management system. All the nutrients that come in go out the back end. You apply those to your fields just like if you apply the dairy manure itself. You're going to overload your fields. You're going to have nitrogen problems. You're going to have phosphorus problems. It doesn't solve a thing there. What it does do is manages some of the carbon and manages uh, some of the uh, bacterial problems or pharmaceutical problems. It manages some of that, but it doesn't manage nutrients. So why are we looking at this? The adoption of anaerobic digestions is going a lot slower than people had predicted or that some agencies want. And it's hindered primarily because of costs and finances. Nobody wants to fund, fund these or finance them because quite frankly, when you're just doing anaerobic digestion or you're just doing anaerobic digestion for power, it doesn't really work that well financially. And we're looking at pyrolysis because it offers an effective means to treat recalcitrant fiber that remains after digestion and develop some potentially valuable co-products. And just as I said, numerous fields surrounding uh, dairies and capos are currently overloaded with nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, last I checked, it was around 36 and 55%. So, can we use char based filters to effectively filter some of those nutrients out and reduce some of that nutrient overload? Now, in looking at this, there are a few properties that we need to consider. The pyrolysis unit should be able to operate with uh, little maintenance using the digestate fiber. The char modification should not require an abundance of purchased chemicals or generate significant wastewater. If we start generating wastewater, if we start generating additional treatment steps that we need, we've effectively killed any kind of financial incentive for people to adopt this. So if it's expensive to adopt, it's expensive to implement, or if it's labor intensive and knowledge intensive to operate, nobody's gonna put, wanna put this on their farm. They're not gonna have the resources to operate it. And the filter media should be able to, abor to absorb phosphate and ammonia to relatively near zero levels. You're using this as a final treatment step. And finally, the filter media should not contaminate the treated effluent streams. You shouldn't be having heavy metal run off. You shouldn't be having uh, fractions of the char run off. You shouldn't be having any kind of collision problems run off of this. Otherwise, again, you've completely killed the reason that you're filtering the stream. So this is one little possible scheme that we're working, that we've went in working on. And it, look, it looks really nice. It seems great. Not exactly working the way that we want right now couple of reasons for that, I can get into it, but the scheme is basically we have an anaerobic digester. We've got one other person in our group that was looking at taking some of the light compounds, the C1 and C4 compounds from pyrolysis vapors and digesting those. I've given a presentation on that. It works to a degree. Uh, after that, you run it through a solid separation, and then the two that I'm going to be working on are, I've got a mouse right here, uh, precipitation of alkaline and alkaline earth metals, and then char oxidation. And we're doing this pre and post pyrolysis to try and modify some of the surface functionality to try and get some of the anions and the cations out of solution because this is where activated carbon fails. This is where those nutrients are. They're in the ammonium, they're in the phosphates. So, <coughs> my experience with activated carbon is that just as a straight material for that, it doesn't work very well. Put the biofilm on it with some microbial station there, it may be a little more effective, but the same can be said for char. And we want to use these materials as an ion exchange filtration to clean up the water a little bit and end up with the nitrogen and the phosphorus below the char. We're not quite there yet. So we did a couple of exploratory studies to kind of figure out and fine tune where we wanted to really look. And you know, just straight off the bat, we used unaltered anaerobically digested fiber from a pyrolysis reactor, and Mike, I don't know if you can answer this, I don't know, or if you want to answer this, what temperature does your uh, biochar coming out see oxygen at, or? So the time it gets through the uh, alder is usually about two months. All right, and that answers my question. And that's actually probably a pretty good temperature for it to see oxygen at. Um, and you'll see a nice little graph on that one later. Um, but 
the char that we're producing is it doesn't see oxygen at all, period, between 20 degrees when it enters the reactor all the way up to its 500 degree heating point and all the way back down to cooling under nitrogen at 20 degrees uh, centigrade. So it never sees oxygen at any kind of elevated temperature. It's a very unaltered surface, it's a very hydrophobic surface. It's, it doesn't have really any absorption capacity. So phosphorus absorption, pretty much nothing. Uh, we did find if we precipitate calcium oxides on the surface, we saw a lot of phosphate absorption. We also saw quite a bit of calcium leaching because calcium oxides are sludge soluble, which just goes back into solution. We tried this also with iron oxides because there's been a lot of reports that say iron will help with phosphate. Iron oxides don't do anything, or don't do anything significant compared to calcium. But the interesting one is we found that if we do this prior to pyrolysis, we get pretty <coughs> similar levels of phosphate removal, but we don't get nearly as much leaching. So we looked at this. We we washed off the surface a little bit so that we could just study the effects of the calcium. So we used a 2% nitric acid solution and cleaned that off a little bit. And then we used a calcium chloride solution and modified the pH between 6 and 12. And this is really just to look at the effects of those calcium oxides. This isn't looking at any kind of commercial process. This is just to tell us what's going on. And then we did all the reaction tests in this uh, little microscale reactor. We can do about one gram at a time. But we've got our tube furnace. We've got a cooling section and get this nice and hot about 500 degrees and then we can put the sample in, pyrolyze it for as long as we want under a nitrogen flow and then when we're done pull it out into a cooling section it takes about 20 minutes to cool off and then we've got our sample so all in all it takes about an hour to make a gram of sample not great at all um, just a quick little elemental analysis using pyrolysis we can actually get a pretty decent carbon yield off of the anaerobic digestion char and it, it starts at about 40%, we stay about 40%. The real difference is in the oxygen content and the ash content, and also the hydrogen content cuts to about half. But the ash content on this material was about 25%. The soluble minerals in that were about 7%. So that's your calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. So there's quite a bit of soluble minerals in this material. The rest of it's probably silicates. It came from a flush dairy system The oxygen content also drops from about 25 to 30 percent down to about 11, 12, 13 percent. And so, just a quick look at what the calcium concentration does. We go from about two and a half percent calcium up to about six and a half percent calcium in our in our system. And the char fraction changes proportionally to the increase in alkaline and alkali earth metals. So it's we're not really changing how the material chars, we're just adding more ash to the system. And one of the other important things is looking at how that metal comes off. And interestingly, our biggest leaching problem, with the exception of char treated at pH 12, very high pH, a lot of calcium put on that, our biggest leaching problem is from potassium. And that's, it just does not stay on solid. You put it in some, you put it in an aqueous solution, it, it leaks no matter what you do to it. But this is the interesting one. When we look at it for phosphorus removal, we have our raw char, our untreated char, and we can get about, this translates to 0.1% by weight phosphate removal to the input of char. So for every gram of phosphate that you have in your solution, you would need a kilogram of char. And that's really not a great filtration option. When we start looking at the higher pH treated materials with a lot of calcium on them, we're talking about more in the 1.5% range, and that's looking a little more feasible. And it's important to note here that where we stabilized out at 1.5%, that's just because the solution was at zero. There was no phosphorus left. You couldn't detect any phosphate by any method that we had. But more importantly, and this is pH of about nine and a half, which is a little bit more feasible to reach on the farm. You, you can do that without adding a strong base chemical. We still got good removal. We got almost to 1%. And this has some just interesting properties of not quite 
normal monolayer absorption, but I'm not going to get into that too much. And then the equilibrium absorption. We found that it ties in pretty well with the calcium, with the total calcium, and it follows a nice linear relationship, not only on the total absorption capacity, but on the rate that it pulls uh, material out. More interestingly, if we account for the magnesium concentration, <coughs> it becomes almost perfectly linear. So we know from this and from some other reports that the alkaline metals are really important on the surface if we want to talk about getting phosphate out of the solution just on the chart. And now, as I don't know if I should tell everyone what Chris, Christian calls this, he calls this biochar porn. <laughs> so we've got a few of these, and this is this is what that AD fiber looks like, a little bit more up close after the charring process, and you can see the lot of a lot of imperfections and a lot of a lot of surface area that you get for that. What's interesting is as you zoom in, and this is the raw fiber. This hasn't been acid washed or anything else. You start seeing a lot of these very cool little nanowires, and these things are between about 50 and 200 nanometers wide, and if we go all the way back here, we've got this nice spike in the uh, rate of absorption on the raw char. That might be a reason why. I'm going to be doing a lot more investigation into why we're seeing some of these effects, but it's kind of a cool effect. And this is probably one of the people who've seen more of showing the xylem structure and all the, all the preservations, but you can see the amount of deposition along the surface. And really, with a scanning electron microscope, you're seeing not the image itself, but you're seeing how the electrons interact. So different colorings generally indicate different behaviors. And I wish I had an EDS to uh, see what those minerals were, but I don't know if anyone wants to buy them for me. <laughs> and this is the material treated at pH 12. And what's interesting is you can start to see all of these little lines that start popping up. And if we zoom in, there are very regular shapes, and these, this is the calcium deposition on the surface. This is most probably what's responsible for the phosphate absorption. And I've got another couple of samples that I haven't gotten a chance to test yet that are actually absorbed with phosphate, so we'll be seeing how those compare. I just have not had a chance to go back into the lab and take a look. And here's the important thing is there's, a lot, there's going to be a lot more than just we've got our dairy effluent to run it through a biochar filter and everything's going to be great and perfect. There's going to be a lot more steps because AD effluent is ugly and if we've got some of that here in the test tubes and you can't see through. There's a lot of dissolved <coughs> matter, there's a lot of suspended matter and here is the biochar filter. Here's what's going in and here's what's coming out. It doesn't really look a whole lot different after a short column. But what is important is that first 10 milliliters that went through, we took it from 90 parts per million phosphate down to about 45 parts per million phosphate. Now some of that's suspended solids in there, but we also saw a rapid increase af after that in total phosphates going through. So some of that is also most probably ionic phosphate that's getting pulled out of the solution. And we'll be doing a few more tests on that to confirm, but it does look like we're gonna be able to get that. We just need to design better systems so that can get some of that dissolved and suspended matter out. And just basic conclusions on that. Contacting fiber with calcium oxide increase the absorption capacities of the resulting chars. And you know what? <coughs> We've already been through all of that. So moving on. The experimental equipment, we did some oxidation and we're looking primarily for improved cation exchange capacity. And this is one of the reasons I asked Mike about the temperature that his chars off. And we used ozone, we used cold plasma because it's kind of cool technology and it's sitting in our lab, so why not? And then more practically, we looked at air oxidation. So exposing your, exposing your char to air at an elevated temperature, but not at a temperature it's going to burn. And why are we doing all this? Well, we're doing all of this to try and get some acid functional groups because we want cation exchange capacity. And we did trials a couple of years ago with ozone, and we saw some good results, at least with activated carbon and with bark char. With wood, it just kind of sat there. But with activated carbon, we were able to about double, triple, and it's for activated carbon and spark chart, we were able to actually get cation exchange capacities on the range of 25 to 35 milliequivalents per 100, 100 grams, which is pretty good. It's a lot better than the five that 
zero to five that we were starting with today. And just some XPSs to show the difference. This is bark char as it came out of the uh, pyrolysis reactor, and this is after 10 minutes in ozone. And all of those peaks after the first one are oxygen groups that are forming. And by comparison, if we look at wood, again, we've got a little bit of material, a little bit more oxygen at the start, but this is after an hour in ozone. It just doesn't change that much. But what we're more interested in is how it reacts with air, how it reacts with oxygen, because this is a lot easier to implement, it's a lot cheaper to implement, it's a lot safer to implement. Ozone's just not fun to play with, especially if there's a leak. It burns, it stinks, it's awful. So looking at temperatures, what kind of temperatures can we expose this material to that will modify the surface a little bit but won't cause us to lose too much material? And it looks like between about 200, 250, we can expose it for a good long period of time without really losing a bunch of material. 275, we start losing material by 325. After a four hour exposure period, we had 20% of it before half of our carbon was gone, half of this was ash. And why is that important? Well, we took a look at carboxylic acid groups and some of this is an artifact of the mineral content because we're titrating out the uh, acid groups with the base, but we can also get quite a bit of interference from the carbonates that are in the system. So what we're seeing with the negative values is just carbonate interference. I didn't have enough material at the time that I could acid wash and filter and do all this fun stuff. So the artifacts are just still there. But if we look at the raw char, and you can see that kind of between the raw and the acid wash char. If we do ozone oxidation with this material, it's behaving a lot like the wood did. It didn't do anything. If we look at cold plasma, cool, fun, way too expensive technology, didn't do anything. When we look at the oxidation in air, suddenly we see this huge spike in carboxylic acid groups. And those spikes remain all the way up to about 300 degrees C. After that, at 350, there's no carboxylic acid groups left. It's because they're not stable on the surface at, at that temperature. They'll, they'll fly off, you'll get rapid decomposition of your surface, and you're basically just burning at that temperature. You're doing very slow control burn. But at these temperatures, you can form those uh, carboxylic groups, which becomes interesting for this reason. And I should have put this one up sooner, but oh well. Uh, it's the correlation between ammonium absorption and carboxylic acid groups. And I've done another graph that shows the correlation between carboxylic acid groups and cation exchange capacity. And as you increase those carboxylic groups, you get an almost linear increase with cation exchange capacity with ammonium absorption. And so improving those groups becomes very important for getting things like copper, zinc, ammonium, everything else out of solution because that's where those sites bind, that's where they stay. But it also had a somewhat interesting effect on changes in soluble matter. And really the one I want you guys to take a look at is at 350 degrees, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly what changes took place here that caused this, but our soluble matter dropped through the floor when we got to that point on with every material that I measured. Sodium, magnesium, cal calcium, potassium, and iron. We saw considerably less leaching even in an acid wash solution once these materials saw temperatures above 300 degrees centigrade. And it's an interesting note for the nutrient availability that might be available at for materials that have seen these kind of temperatures in an oxidizing condition. Now, the other problem that comes up with this is the last statement that I made at the beginning, which is we shouldn't be releasing compounds into the water. So what is the soluble matter that comes off due to oxidation? At moderate pH, H9, we see pretty good stability. There's a little bit of discoloration in the solutions for the oxygen treater, but nothing too bad. We need to do some evaluations and see what those chemicals coming off are, if they're anything from toxic. But what might be coming off long range? Quick test, we've elevated the pH to 12, and the story changes quite a bit. This is our raw material. Nothing comes off. It's still a nice, stable, clean surface. However, with our oxygen treated samples, there's a couple on there that just went black. So it raises some questions about exactly what is coming off. 
showing you actually those. Basic conclusion, and just because I showed the uh, SVMs earlier, this is another technique that I want to look at, which, and this is just some cool stuff that I, that I like for the science. So this is a CEM image, and this is actually of an algae cell. What you're seeing right there that it's focused in on is the lipid bilayer. So this is just some stuff I want to take a look at and really get a good look at the charts later on. So I'd like to thank all of the people that, and all of the funding agencies in Washington that have helped support this, including Ecology and uh, the Department of Agriculture as well. My group for putting up with me. Any questions? losing some nutrients, um, but we're generally, compared to combustion, we're at, we're at really low temperatures. We're at only 500 degrees, so our, our main concern then was <coughs> sodium and potassium. Yeah, what we found was that in the early stages of combustion at relatively low temperatures, okay. because they're as hydroxide, they, 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 they volatilize very easily, we actually lose those very quickly in the reaction chloride and so on and so on. I, I was wondering if same sort of mechanism. I haven't looked at that yet, but uh, that is a good thing that I'll try and consider. Option, but we're looking at the dynamic state fiber template because also the cakes are locked more consistently in higher temperatures. We don't have any of that reactants or anything else that are going to cause a lot of problems. We've got a nice, stable, mostly liquid product that's going to, to quite frankly, behave well in a higher water and a higher water climate. If I can comment on that, I think the, what we're seeing is the areas that are out on our west coast, which have less low cost bedding material available to them are using the fiber digesters. They're having digesters. And your area in East Side, there's a lot of low cost bedding available to them. Question. Yes. Um, I was going to ask on the slides uh, about the phosphate removal, your retention time before it went flat was something on the order of 10 hours? Yeah. Okay. So it, it, in a, not in the laboratory process, how could you sort of model something like that where you could successfully retain something for 10 hours to pull those phosphates out when you got more stuff coming downstream? It, it would be a filter column design. It simply becomes how, how large do you make your filter column? And these are equilibrium and batch studies. And one of the things as that filter column moves down is constantly exposing fresh unadsorbed material where you see the highest adsorption rates. So it's, it's really as you start saturating that material that that adsorption starts falling off. 
back and look at the absorption curves. What we see is that here for about the first couple hours as, and really it's the first two hours, as we're reaching that maximum absorption capacity, it's a very, very rapid absorption. So as it's moving through, you may only need a three hour retention time in your filter column. And that, that can be pretty easily achieved by modifying the diameter and modifying the, the height of your column. So those represent a saturated state? Um, after about 10 hours, yeah, it's a, at least a monolayer saturated state. It, we get some weird behavior and some weird uh, multi-layer behavior after this. And I do individual batches for each trial point. And so depending on the surface area, because it's dairy fiber, it's, and I'm working with small volumes of about 50 milligrams for these. I'm still in the very heterogeneous material range, so I'll, get, I'll see some nice fluctuations after this point. No matter what I do, I always get this really nice first layer formation. That behaves very well. It's the behavior of the multi-layers after that that gets a little misbehaved. 